Be that, is, be that as it may, we can agree to disagree. I also want to welcome our international audience um, live streaming at this point in time from all over the world um, to Timbuktu Books. We say welcome to you. We are not going to delay uh, much because we are pressed for time. Um, what I'm going to, I'm going, before I'm going to hand over to Molina, um, we, what I would, in, in fact, it's something that I suggested, is that we just need to have some form of um, discussion and for Molina to, to just sort of brief us how this work came about and the relevance of this work today, um, specifically what is happening in the uh, Middle East as we can see it. So without further ado, I am going to hand over to uh, Molina Imran and Molina will be uh, discussing the matter on uh, the Caliphate, the Hijaz and the Saudi Wahhabi nation state, uh, Molina. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi al-lazeen astafa khususan ala abdalihim wa khatamin nabihi muhammadin al-amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa ba' to the representative of Timbuktu books and uh, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I would have much preferred to be sitting on one of your chairs than on this sofa. <laughs> um, that's a more comfortable chair for me. The book that we are discussing tonight here at Timbuktu Books in Cape Town, beautiful Cape Town in South Africa, uh, entitled The Caliphate, the Hijaz, and the Saudi Wahhabi Nation State, was actually one chapter of my PhD thesis that I was writing when I was uh, a doctoral student at the Graduate Institute of International Studies in Geneva from 1974. So this was written somewhere around 75 or 76. Uh, it was the beginning of the thesis and the rest of the thesis was devoted to the, the uh, review of the events which took place since the collapse of the Khilafa, the Ottoman Khilafa or Caliphate, up to the birth of the organization of today's called Organization of Islamic State. But at the time it was created, it was called the Organization, L'Organisation de la Conference Islamique. You know? The Organization of the Conference Islamic, the Organization of the Islamic Conference, OIC. <laughs> because the title was given in French and then translated from French to English. And uh, then I went to work on the analysis of the, um, the constitution of this organization, the charter of the organization. A very interesting analysis, it has never been published, still lying there. And uh, this book remained like that since uh, 1976. In uh, 1996, 20 years later, it was, the, it was the 25th anniversary of the death of my teacher, Dr. Memory Molana, Dr. Muhammad Fadrahman Ansari. And I was based in New York. And I wanted to offer a gift to my teacher that no one could possibly match. So I started from 1994 and I worked for three years. So that 1997, when his 25th 
that anniversary came, I was able to publish six books in what I call the Ansari Memorial Series. Because he had published in memory of his chef, the Alimia Memorial Series. And I wanted to follow in that noble tradition. So I published six books in 1997. One of the six being the Caliphate, the Hijaz, and the Saudi Wahhabi nation state. At that time, yes, we did have computers, but we didn't have the internet. And uh, I didn't have the technology how to get the Arabic text of a Quran, put it on to the... Now even a school child, school boy could do that. But at that time, I couldn't do it. So the books which were published at that time didn't have the Arabic text. And Allah didn't speak in English. No, he spoke in Arabic. <laughs> so those six books which were published at that time, now in my old age, now I have to try to edit them and review them and re reprint them in new editions. And one of the first that I did was this one. The Caliphate, the Hijaz, and the Saudi Wahhabi nation state. Uh, this was printed, this was published last year. And um, what I realized was that at the time when I was writing that PhD thesis, I had a hint of eschatology, but only a hint. I knew there was something out there, but I didn't know it. And uh, I had to wait until Allah, in His kindness, took me to Ilmu Akhir al Zaman. And only then did I begin to connect the dots and understand the big picture in which this subject is located. The, the, the collapse and the destruction of the Islamic Caliphate of Khilafa. So when I brought out this second edition of the book, I wrote a new introduction, a long introduction. And in that introduction, I put in that which was missing. The eschatological, it's a long word, eh? the eschatological analysis which was not there in the first edition. Uh, after this, I went to my book on the Quranic method of curing alcoholism and drug addiction. And I worked on it for a few months, and we recently brought out the second edition. And then for the last four months or so, I've been working on my book on dreams. It took me about four months to write, to rewrite it, bring out a new edition. And alhamdulillah, I completed it right here in South Africa on this tour when I was in Pretoria. And yesterday I sent it to be put on my website for free download. So you can go now and you can read the book, The Strategic Importance of Dreams and Visions in Islam. I know women are going to be more interested in the subject than me. <laughs> and uh, I now go on to the religion of Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salam, and the state of Israel, the view from the Quran. All of these books were written at that time, when I was in New York. I don't know how many months it will take me to complete the second edition of this book, The Religion of Abraham and the State of Israel. A view from the Quran. When I'm finished with that, then the big one, and I don't know where I'm going to get it straight from, the prohibition of riba in the Quran and Sunnah. Because that's a tough subject. And I wrote that book at that time, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And since then, Allah has blessed me with much more knowledge of the subject. So this book, to rewrite this book, may, I don't know, may take me a whole year. So tell me, Mahdi, when will I get the time to write the book of Dajjal? <laughs> my, my wife is sitting at the back there and she's quarreling with me. Molana, when will you write the book on Dajjal? When will you 
book and Dajjal. Everybody waiting for the book and Dajjal. But Dajjal is connected with this subject. Oh yes, the Caliphate, the Hijaz, and the Saudi Wahhabi nation state. That is the political dimension to the job. He is the he is the false messiah. He's the one who would want to impersonate the true messiah. The true messiah must rule the world. Who said so? Nabi Muhammad that the true messiah when he returns he would be Hakim Hakim from Kukuma the one who rules Hakim al-Adl the one who rules with justice the Jewish scriptures say the same thing that the messiah would rule the world from Jerusalem from the holy state of Israel and so it follows therefrom that if the Jal is to successfully, listen carefully, if the Jal is to successfully impersonate the Messiah, he must rule the world from Jerusalem. He must rule the world from a state of Israel. So the Holy Land has to be liberated for the Jews because it's under Muslim rule. The Jews have to be brought back to the Holy Land because they've been expelled. And they've been living in exile, in exile for 2,000 years. The state of Israel has to be restored in the Holy Land. And that state of Israel would have to become like the Israel of Nabi Suleiman Islam. Remember the story with Bilkis, Queen of Sheba? a ruling state in the world. No one can stand up to this Israel. And so we have the political analysis to look at and to trace and to identify the movement of the Jal. As for example, the Holy Land was liberated for the Jews in what year? 19? 19? 19? Timbuktu books, you're not, I'm not hearing you. 1917, British Army with Arabs fighting loyally <laughs> under the British general with, uh, uh, to liberate the Holy Land, fighting the Turkish troops, the Ottoman, sorry. And then between 1917 and 1948, the Holy Land is under British rule called a mandate conferred by the League of Nations. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Iqbal referred to it as the League of Thieves. <laughs> and then in 1948, another milestone is achieved. A state of Israel is born in the Holy Land. When you connect the dots, then you understand what's happening. But when they said they wanted all that they wanted was a home for a people who didn't have a home, the Jews. <coughs> they were lying to their teeth. No. And they knew it. They didn't want a home for a people who didn't have a home. They wanted to create a state which would eventually rule the world. And after the state of Israel was created, it was protected by countless U.S. vetoes in the Security Council of the United Nations. Until today, Israel is a superpower. And the Prime Minister of Israel, who at this time is, I believe, is still in a coma, could boast. He could boast openly, we control the United States of America. That's what he said. Yeah. And no American president dares to challenge him. <laughs> so in fact, Israel is already ruling the world from behind the Parda, behind the hijab, minwara el hijab. But Israel has to come out from behind the hijab and openly rule over the world before the Jal could emerge as the ruler, ruling over Israel in Jerusalem and then declaring 
I am the Messiah. Of course, he had to destroy Masjid Al-Aqsa, perhaps with a convenient earthquake, and then rebuild the temple, and then claim to be the Messiah. Of course, he had to get rid of all the paper money. You know the bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram paper money. And one day, who knows? Who knows? One day, we might even have the ulama of Islam waking up. <laughs> who knows? If they will ever wake up. We've been trying for a long time now to give the fatwa that the paper money is haram. Who knows? It might happen one day. I don't know. And uh, in order for the Jal to convince the Jews that he is indeed the true Messiah, Israel will have to use gold and silver coins and money. Huh? Is that so difficult to recognize and understand? And if Israel is to be the ruling state in the world, then she'll have to ensure that the rest of the world is using gold and silver coins as money. That's coming. But our subject is located in this thesis that you could not achieve any of these. You could not liberate the Holy Land for the Jews in 1917. You could not bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. You could not restore the state of Israel in the Holy Land. And you could not get that Israel to grow to become the Israel of the history if the world of Islam had a Khilafa. Not possible. And so the master plan has to be what strategy can we adopt to dismantle the Khilafa? And the strategy was to first of all take the Khilafa or the Caliphate out of the Arab world. Take it out of the Arab world. And that's why out of the blue the Ottoman Empire emerged. Mysteriously out of the blue. Hmm? And when the Ottoman Empire emerged with a, with a mysterious power they were able to expand and eventually to take the whole of the Hijaz and take Makkah and Medina and take over the Hajj and then to claim the Khilafah and so the Islamic Khilafah is now out of the Arab world which is the heartland of Islam even our Salat is performed in Arabic you can't perform Salat in Turkish, can you? <laughs> Our Salat is performed in Arabic. The Blessed Quran is sent down in Arabic, not in English. There's no such thing as an English Quran. There's no such thing as a French Quran. There's only one Quran, it's in Arabic. So the Arabic language and the Arabic world are located in the heart of Islam. And if you take, if you can take the Khilafah out of the Arab world, then when the time comes, it will be easier for you to slice, slice off the neck and make your zabiha. <laughs> hmm? Is that so difficult to understand? That was the master plan. But to add some salt to the wound, the other major actor on the stage of the world who constituted a stumbling block to Dajjal's mission of achieving what he wants to achieve was that part of the Christian world which was remaining faithful to Christianity, namely the Orthodox Christian world. And the Orthodox Christian world had its capital in a city called 
What's the name? Constantinople. Nobody uses the name Constantinople anymore. No. It has been banned. Did you know that? The name Constantinople has been mysteriously banned. You cannot use it in Turkey. If you use it, you can be arrested. Why? It's good to ask questions, you know, sometimes. Because when you ask questions, you can get interesting answers. Hmm. Rather than eating biryani and going home and sleep. And you see when the biryani has too much spices in it? You get half good. <laughs> Which is what I have today. <laughs> it's good to ask questions. It's good to think. It's a wonderful <coughs> thing to do, to think. And Allah sent down the Quran to a people who think. And thinking is not restricted to men. Oh no? Allah sent down the Quran to both men and women. Men and women. So, if you want to achieve these objectives and ultimately to rule the world from Jerusalem, to liberate the Holy Land, to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land, to reclaim it as their own, to restore the state of Israel to the Holy Land, to cause that Israel to rule the world, if you want, to achieve these objectives, you need to do something about the caliphate, or the khilafah. You have to get rid of it. That's a tall order. Because in the Quran itself, Allah has given the command. Ati'ullah, ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, ba'ala uzi billahi min shaitan wa'ayyuhi. More you who have faith. Ati'ullah, obey Allah. Wa'ati or Rasul and obey the Messenger of Allah. Wa ulil amri minkum and obey those in authority amongst you. And my teacher of blessed memory, Mulana Fadl Rahman Ansari, gives it a seal. Hold of it, hold it and obey those in lawfully constituted authority. You see how sharp, you see how sharp the Mulana is? And obey those in lawfully constituted authority from amongst you and the barrel of a gun. It's called coup d'etat. The barrel, it's called martial law. The barrel of a gun is not lawful, lawfully constituted authority. Those who are in lawfully constituted authority are the Amir al And you have to be a Jama'ah in obedience to him. That was the Khilafah state. And the Amir himself has to be in submission to the authority of the Prophet. Al Islam not not the Security Council of the United Nations. And the Prophet himself has to be in submission to the authority of Allah. Hmm. So the Khilafah state is a state which is in a state of subjection and submission to Allah and to his Messenger. When Allah made halal, the Khilafah state has to recognize as halal. And what Allah made haram, the Khilafah state has to ensure it is recognized as haram. So if we had the Khilafah state, we wouldn't be in the mess in which we are today. Huh? Mullah well, Imran. I didn't know. And I went and took the bank loan. And we bought the house. And I'm now in 60,000 euros in debt. And I also bought the car. What to do? <laughs> you will be surprised how many emails I'm getting from all over the world with, by Muslims who went, and, went into the trap of riba with their eyes half open. If we had the Khilafah state, you wouldn't have the banking system today strangling you 
And tomorrow is not going to be the state which is ruling over you. And government, no. Tomorrow the banks will rule over you. But you don't know it. <laughs> you don't know it. So in order for Islam to be authentic, you need to have this expression of public Islam. You need to have authority. You need to have government. You need to have this Khilafati. So how are you going to get rid of it? It's a tall order. And what this book has done is to explain the strategy. That the first thing you have to do is to take the Khilafah out of the Arab world and to add some salt to the wound you take it to the capital city of the Christians who are your natural allies the capital city of the Christians who are mentioned in the Quran as the people will be closest in love and affection for you. It's there in the Quran. And if there's anyone who wants to challenge me, I would be happy to respond. And it's not going to be a boxing match, no, because we are in a learned discussion. And at the end of the, the discussion, we have a cup of tea. That's a civilized way. <laughs> or maybe a cup of coffee. Yeah. These are the people who are mentioned in the Qur'an, in the Qur'an, in the Qur'an, as those who are going to be closest in love and affection for you. And their capital city is Constantinople. And you take the Khilafah out of the Arab world and you pack it up in Constantinople. So it's not a nice expression, eh? I don't like to use it. In English language, they say to kill two birds with one stone, or to what, to what, to what, to what. <laughs> they shouldn't be killing birds with stones. <laughs> but they have it, they say, to kill two birds with one stone. It's a wicked man <laughs> who coined that expression. Yes. Number one, you have taken the Khilafah out of the Arab world. And so you have achieved the first stage of the process of destroying and dismantling the Khilafah. And number two, you have plunged the dagger into the heart of those who are going to be your natural allies in the effort to confront the dagger. <coughs> The next step of the process was the story of this book. The events of 1914 to 1924, those 10 years. When the Ottoman Empire was targeted by its friends, the Ottomans were always friends of Britain and France. And the Ottomans were always the bitter enemies of the Orthodox Christians, waging jihad against them, or more properly called bogus jihad against them. And they did it for 500 years. Russia was a special target of the Ottoman Empire. Constantly, constantly, constantly waging war on Russia. And to add some salt to the wound, the Ottomans had a people in Crimea called the Tatar Muslims. And these Tatar were horsemen. Oh, they knew how to ride horses. I tell you. They were skilled horsemen. And they would go on a raid 
these so-called Muslims. And when they go out on a raid, they're going to seize innocent people. That's their Islam. But they will move with lightning speed to their target, hundreds of miles away from Crimea, usually into Russia. And they'll go and seize villages and enslave the people. And then with lightning speed, they will head back to Tatarland, to Crimea. And then they will sell, sell these people to the Ottoman Empire. And that's how the Ottomans got most of their slaves. They will call these, these are Christian women, many of them Russian women. They will call them Milka Yamin. Hmm. Milka Yamin. And the Ottoman sultans never married, no. So all of them had only half a man. Because as the Sheikh will tell you here, the Prophet said, and nikah for this holy man. The marriage is half of a faith. So if you don't have a, ma a wife, and you're sitting in this gallery, better get a wife. <laughs> better get a wife. Because marriage is half of your faith. But the Ottoman sultans never married. So, why did they, how did they have children? They had children with the slaves. How did they get the slaves? It was Christian women. It was always Orthodox Christian women. And these children, the male children, would eventually become Sultan. So when the Ottoman Empire launches a jihad against the Christian people, it's the son of your own daughter, a Christian woman. Her son is waging war on you. So that is adding salt to the wound. In addition to that, when they would defeat the Christian people, the terms for a ceasefire would be that they'd have to pay a tribute called Anfal every year. But in addition to that, they had to hand over a certain amount of a certain number of Christian boys. Is this Islam? Where did this Islam come from? Mars or Venus? Hand over a certain number of Christian boys. This would be 10, 11, 12 years of age. Part of the ceasefire agreement. And these boys will be converted to Islam by force. Shame on you. Shame on you. And then these boys will be trained to become the elite fighting force of the Ottoman armed forces. They call the Janissaries. So when the Ottoman army comes to attack a Christian people, it's your own sons who are the elite fighting force. This, all of this is not by accident. No, no, no. The John created the Ottoman Empire to serve him, to do his dirty work for him. That's what the Ottomans were there for. So they were killing many birds with the same stone. And when the time came, the British and the French abandoned the Ottoman Empire. They checkmated the Ottoman Empire when they were ready to take the Holy Land from the Ottoman Empire. They simply discarded the Ottoman Empire. And what they did, very cleverly, in order to ensure that the Ottomans cannot come and knock on the door of London or Paris to ask to become your allies, Britain and France made an alliance with Russia. That was brilliant on their part. It was 1909. And once that alliance was made with Russia, the Ottoman Empire is checkmated. You cannot be a part of this alliance. So the Ottomans have to make friends with Germany and then the First World War starts and the Ottoman Empire is on the wrong side of Britain and France. And when they lost the war, it was easy for Britain to now seize the Holy Land. <coughs> but that was not the only purpose of the First World War. It was not only to liberate the Holy Land for the Jews, 
but also to preside over the dismantling of the Khilafah. Mm. So when they were ready, they had their clone, someone they had selected and uh, trained him for the job, like they did with that man in Pakistan. The Pakistanis ended up calling him a dog. What, what Musharraf was he? Parvez? General Parvez Musharraf? Maybe one day he might even hear these words of mine, yes. That the Pakistani people were calling you a dog. Hmm. That's not a nice thing to do. No. That's what they said. Dog Musharraf, dog. Because he was chosen. And he was groomed. And so too was Mustafa Kamal. Groomed to do the job. And uh, it was on the 3rd of March, 1924, that the Turkish Grand National Assembly adopted a resolution abolishing the Khilafah. But Dajjal, who had created the Ottoman Empire, and now abandon it, had to have a replacement. And that was Saudi Arabia. And he had to use Saudi Arabia to block any effort to restore the Khilafah in the Arab world. When the Turkish Grand National Assembly acted on the 3rd of March, 1924, to abolish the Khilafah. Four days later, the great grandfather of the present king of Jordan, his name was Hussein bin Ali, and he was known as Sharif Hussein, which is where the Americans got the term Sharif, the Sharif of this city and the Sharif of that city. He came from Sharif. And he was appointed as Sharif of Makkah by the Ottoman Khalifa. What was his name? Hussein bin Ali. He was in control of Makkah. He rebelled against the Ottomans with British help and with a considerable sum of British money. And I guess also with weapons transferred to him. And he has succeeded in taking Makkah out of the grip of the Ottoman Empire, Ottoman Khalifa. So this man, four days after the abolition of the Khilafah in Constantinople, he claimed the Khilafah in Mecca. And guess what the so-called Saudi Wahhabi champions of Islam did? <laughs> The Saudi Wahhabi champions of Islam then attacked him. And with British help, they were able to remove him and take control of Mecca. And so long as the Saudi Wahhabi controlled Mecca, no one could claim to be Khalifa. How can you be Khalifa? Answer me. And when the Hajj comes, you have to send your application for a visa. <laughs> and you are Khalifa. If you are Khalifa, you have to control the Hajj. And you cannot control the Hajj, so long as the Saudi Wahhabi are in control of Makkah. And they will never give it up. Because they are like the Ottoman Empire, created by the Dajjal to serve his mission. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of the end. The Al Azhar University chose to respond with a conference in 1926, and we have recorded it in this book, for those who don't have the time for the history. And then the Saudi Wahhabis chose to sabotage that conference with their own conference in 1926. And then after that, there were one or two little talks about it. And that's the end, finished. 
the Khilafah is buried, gone. Nobody even talks about it now. Mm. That is brilliant planning on the part of the Jewish Christian Alliance, the Zionist Alliance. And they have the same planning for the Hajj. It's going to disappear, you know. There won't be Hajj tomorrow. Yeah. Who says so? It's there in Sahih Bukhari. That way it is. That the Hajj is also going to go. Hmm? In order for them, however, to reach the ultimate objective that the Dajjal will be able to stand up in Jerusalem and declare, I am the Messiah, and they get away with that. You still have some more work to do. You have to abandon Saudi Arabia the way you abandoned the Ottoman Empire when the time is proper and put something else in place of Saudi Arabia to do your dirty work for you. What is it? Do you know? It's ISIS, that's right. And so ISIS is not going to remain where it is now. It has a big, big, big role to play. And it's just starting now. But if you're only eating biryani and going home and sleep, <laughs> you wouldn't have any clue of what's coming ahead. So I have in this book recorded for you that history and I've analyzed it for you so you'll be able to understand what is the master plan and how our scholarship has failed, Islamic scholarship. We have failed in the world of money. Oh yes, we failed in the world of money. We failed on the Khilafah. We fail in not recognizing who are our natural allies. The Orthodox Christian world today is led by whom? Is it led by Greece? Huh? <coughs> How can Greece be the leader of the Orthodox Christian world when Greece is a member of NATO? Don't you have any sense? <laughs> is it Bulgaria? Is it Armenia? Why, why, why can't people understand? What are they afraid about? The natural leader of the Orthodox Christian world is nuclear Russia, but they're scared of saying so. They've been so brainwashed. Over centuries of brainwashing. You know, thank Allah that I was born in that beautiful island of Trinidad in the Caribbean. Sheikh Ali Mustafa was born in Suriname in the South American mainland, not far from me. So being born in the Caribbean, the beautiful islands of the Caribbean, the mind was able to develop free from all the baggage. <laughs> free from all the baggage of the centuries. And to turn and study history with a fresh virgin mind. This is what we need today. We need scholars of Islam who can make a break with traditional thinking and go to the Quran directly and let the Quran open its doors so you can understand the world today and you can anticipate the world tomorrow. I hope and I pray that this humble book of mine would be of some benefit for you, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to say thank you to Molina for that very, very extensive uh, explanation. We are heading for Maghrib uh, Wakt coming. So Molina has really planned it extremely well. We've got about three minutes that I'm going to, or two minutes that I'm going to allow for any questions right now. Any questions from the blog. There's a question at the back. It's, it's more a statement. You referred to the uh, Israeli Prime Minister that was in a coma. It was Ariel Sharon in the air, so passed on. So yes. But he was in a coma for quite a long time. Yes, yes. It is Ariel Sharon who said, we control the United States of America. Yeah. Any other comment or question? Anyway, from the floor? Well, there's yeah. a question on that. 
Orthodox Christians of Russia. Um, can Molda explain the fact that uh, there is a conflict with regards to the release of, of Christianity? Isn't it the fact that uh, the alliance with the Christians would be the Christians who believe in the Esau as prophet and not as the son of God? Can Molda just explain the, the concept of, of this alliance? How? The question is, how can they be our dearest friends when they worship Jesus? Answer me. I am not the one to answer that question. Allah must answer it. Because I did not say it. It is He who said. And it's there in the Quran and you know it. But you've been sleeping over it. وَلَتَجِدَنَّ أَقْرَبَهُمْ مَوَدَّةً لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّا نَصَارَ That you will most certainly find in time to come that those who will be closest in love and affection for you would be those who say we are Christians. And at the time when the Quran was revealed, the Christians were already worshipping Jesus. So you've got to pose that question to the Lord God, not to me. The Quran is the truth for them. But one question then. Go ahead. Well, I don't know if I don't, um, perhaps it's, uh, or maybe it's too short for him to answer this, but what was the nature of the Islamic State then before the advent of the Ottoman Empire, just so that we can compare how different it was, and then in today's world, and while you say that it was in the current... Oh, you're asking two questions in one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 that's what we're doing. You're not getting two birds with one stone. Oh, no, no. <laughs> because if you are to, 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 to re-establish that, how does one then do that? Yeah. And how is It's a hopeless task. An absolutely hopeless task. When we cannot even get rid of the bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram paper money which even a schoolboy just a schoolboy could recognize with elementary study of the subject would recognize you can't take a piece of paper and print a picture on it and put a number in it and assign to it a fictitious value huh? even a schoolboy would say you should go to jail for that <laughs> If we cannot get rid of this, which is so simple to understand, and I always remember Malana Sima, Rahimahullah, from Garolo, Newcastle. When I lectured on the subject of Islam and the international monetary system some years ago, the learned Malana sat in front of me for two hours. And at the end of the lecture, he said to me, Imran, we must teach this subject in the Darululum. Yes. It's not being taught, but they're giving fatwa. The, the Khilafa state was under attack. And we could see the attack being launched from the time of Amir Ma'wiyah. Amir Ma'wiyah, who replaced Khilafa with Mulukia. The family is now ruling. Okay? Uh, but more than that with Amir Mawia. Explain to me, Amir Mawia, you are a companion of the Prophet Islam, and so we must address you with respect. And we are not being disrespectful to you, Amir Mawia. How come you launched a jihad against Constantinople? How? What kind of mathematics do you use? I mean, Maria, I want an answer. When the conquest of Constantinople is to take place after the Malhama, and the Malhama had not as yet occurred, but Amir Maria is the one who launched the first jihad against Constantinople. And then we are told that Abu Ayyub al Ansari. We are told that he died and he was buried outside the walls. 
they buried him secretly. So that if ever we conquer Constantinople, we can take out his grave and he'll be buried. I want the proof of that. I'm looking forward to see the proof of that on Judgment Day. <coughs> because this seems to me sinister that you're setting this precedent for a lifelong struggle against Orthodox Christianity. When Allah has told us these are your natural allies. And if that alliance is going to come into being, you can't stop it. And the Bosnians can't stop it, the Albanians can't stop it, and the people of Chetnia and Dagestan cannot stop it. No, no one can stop it. If Allah has ordained that this alliance is to take, and guess who is in alliance with them now? Every day the alliance is being formulated strong. It's Iran. And where is the Sunni world? <laughs> Eating biryani and going to sleep. <laughs> That's where it's only what is there. We will, yeah, we will just uh, wrap up now. I think now there's no more questions. I want to thank Molana for, for the time of give, giving us that expose on this particular work. As always, Jazakumullah, Shukran, thank you very much for availing yourself and availing the time to, to, to be with us. To everybody in the audience, thank you very, very much. Um, I will ask uh, Molana Mustafa to, to, to close with the uh, closing to her. On behalf of my directors and my management, we want to thank Morana for availing this time to have come out to Timbuktu Books and educate us. The question that I do have, I will post you later on, more if it's on, 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 on us right now. So I'm going to hand over to um, Sheikh Ali Mustafa just to do the closing to us. Jazakumullah. <laughs> صلى الله على خير خلقه محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين Thank you everybody for coming and waiting so